Have you ever wondered? And I think this is a universal question that all of us have asked at one point in time or another. If God is all-powerful, if God is all-knowing, if God is good, then why does he allow bad things to happen? If God has got the ability to stop evil, if God has the knowledge and the ability to stop bad things from happening, then why does he allow them? And the conclusion that many people come up with is that either God is not good or God is not all-powerful. And you see, that very question of why does God allow bad things to happen may have you doubting your faith. It may have you questioning Jesus and questioning your faith. Maybe something bad has happened in your life or to someone you love and you prayed and you prayed earnestly and God did not answer your prayer the way that you thought he should. Maybe you have even walked away from the faith. If God is good, why does bad things happen? But have you ever noticed when we focus on the bad, our focus is always out there? We're quick to point our fingers at someone else or something else and identify it as being bad. Identify it as being evil. We're always focused out there. Have you ever noticed we are never focused on the bad in here? We're never focused on self. <laughs> Let me ask you a rhetorical question. Have you ever done anything bad? Now, let's push it a step further. Have you ever wanted to do something really, really bad and the only reason you did not do it is because you were afraid you would get caught? You were afraid that you would end up in prison? You know, never have I heard it asked, how could a good God allow me, someone who's evil, someone who's bad, to happen? I mean, have you ever thought about that? Let's push it. If God was good, he would have had to have done something about me by now. I mean, isn't that the logical conclusion? And if you really pushed it and kept on taking it another step, we would actually come to the conclusion of, I don't believe in God because I exist. And that's an illogical conclusion, isn't it? Now, if John, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Apostle John, if John heard us asking this question, if God is good, why do bad things happen? I think John would say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Just hold on for a moment. I saw it with my own eyes, John would say. I heard it with my own ears. God became incarnate. God in a body. God became a human being and he dwelt among us. He dwelt in a fallen and evil world. And he didn't come to abolish the evil. He came to love us in spite of our evil. And John records these signs all throughout his gospel. Now, oftentimes, you and I, would ref we would refer to them as being miracles. But John calls them signs. You see, a sign points to something or to someone. And in the gospel of John, John is identifying these signs that point to Jesus in the hopes that you and I would come to the same conclusion that John did that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that we've been waiting for, the very Son of God. Now, let's just kind of give a little bit of context here. So Jesus, in his earthly ministry, he was constantly between Galilee and Jerusalem. Now, Galilee is in the northern region of modern-day Israel. It's called the Galilee region. In fact, he based his ministry out of Capernaum on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus oftentimes would travel between the region of Galilee. He would travel south to the region of Judea, to the capital, Jerusalem, where the temple was. Now, every time Jesus went into Jerusalem, especially when he went to the temple, he would bump heads with the religious leaders. And oftentimes, his very life was in danger. In John chapter 10, go ahead, open up your Bibles or open up your Bible app to John chapter 10, verse 22. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. I mean, I could picture all these people gathering around Jesus. Jesus, I mean, come on, when are you going to tell us? Jesus, are you the Messiah or not? Jesus, just tell us. Are you the one that we've been looking for? 
Jesus answered them, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe. Jesus is saying, I, guys, I did tell you. I'm revealing to you who I am. And all of these signs, all of these works that I'm doing testify about me, but you willfully don't believe. You are willfully blind. Jesus is saying, I'm revealing myself. I'm making myself known. I showed you, but you're willfully blind. And Jesus goes on to say, my sheep know my voice and my sheep follow me. And then all of a sudden, these, these Jews, these religious leaders, they picked up stones in order to stone him to death. The scripture says that Jesus escaped and he left Jerusalem and he traveled about 25 miles to the east. He left the, the mountaintop of Jerusalem and he traveled all the way down to the Jordan Valley River Rift. Okay, to the area where John the Baptist would baptize. About 25 miles, a day's journey away from Jerusalem. Now he's down there in the Jordan River Basin and John goes on to record, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany. Now Bethany lie only about two miles away from Jerusalem. So the man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. I mean, can you imagine the messenger coming up to Jesus and saying, Lord, the one you love didn't even identify him by name. I mean, can you imagine having such a close relationship with Jesus that you're known as the one you love? Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. In reality, Lazarus had already died. Jesus goes on to say, no, it is for God's glory. Whoa, 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 whoa. wait a minute here. You mean this sickness... This negative thing, this evil, bad thing is happening for God's glory? Well, wait a minute, Jesus. This doesn't make sense. Bad things for God's glory? Uh, Jesus, and, and this was something natural. I mean, this wasn't the result of another human being's bad behavior. No, no, no. This is something natural that's taking place. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son, here's the purpose, that God's Son may be glorified through it. I know for us that doesn't make sense, does it? And then John gives this commentary. He gives this editorial comment. He goes on to record, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. I mean, why in the world do you think John would include that statement? That Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Here's why I think it is. Because Jesus loved them. But you know what? It doesn't look like it. At least not at this moment, does it? You know, sometimes in our lives, let's be honest, it doesn't look like it either, does it? I mean, it's like we know that Jesus loves us intellectually. But at times we find ourselves struggling. Jesus, if you're really there, Jesus, if you really care about me, Jesus, if you love me, then you would be doing something. You would be intervening. You would be helping me. And if you ever found yourself questioning, if you ever found yourself in that, in that particular situation, then my friends, this sign is for you. This sign is for all of us. It's for me. John goes on to record, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. I mean, he was just hanging out down by the Jordan River. Why was Jesus being so slow? Maybe Jesus is staging a sign with a purpose in mind. So after two days, he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. <laughs> but Rabbi, they replied, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and yet you're going back? In other words, danger, Will Robinson, danger. Jesus, we just left the area of Jerusalem. And if we go back, Jesus, they're going to stone you. They're going to put you to death. And Jesus, we're with you. If you get stoned, there's a likelihood that we're going to get stoned as well. Jesus answered them, Are there not 12 hours of daylight? <laughs> it's like, I love how Jesus answers. 
I can picture the disciples going, yeah, thanks for nothing, Jesus. You know, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. To which I'm sure the disciples are thinking to themselves, what in the world are you talking about, Jesus? See, what Jesus is teaching them is that he is the light of the world. And he's challenging them to follow the light. He's saying, guys, you have got this, this momentous moment in time. You are in the very physical presence of the light of the world. Jesus, I am the light of the world. Guys, you will never see so clearly as you are about to see right now. And so don't let fear, don't let fear and uncertainty stop you. Follow the light. But if you refuse, if you refuse to follow the light, you're going to miss out on the opportunity of a lifetime. If you refuse to follow the light, you're going to stumble around in darkness with no answers to your questions, with no purpose to your life, with, with no understanding of what is evil and never understanding life. You're going to walk around in despair. I find it interesting. It was uh, Richard Dawkins. He was a professor at Oxford University a proclaimed atheist who said this, There is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Jesus says, follow me. Follow the light, the light of the world. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. Who's in with me, guys? You ready to go? And then all of a sudden, because they don't want to go, they start giving Jesus medical advice. Have you ever done that? We always want to give Jesus advice on what he should or should not be doing. His his disciples say to Jesus, Jesus, but if he sleeps, he's going to get better. And then Jesus was speaking about his death, but his disciples thought that he meant natural sleep. And so then Jesus tells them plainly, right? Lazarus is dead. And my friends, what comes next? What comes next is extremely harsh. What comes next is painful. It's painful for Mary and Martha who lost their brother. It's painful for Lazarus who had to experience death. It's painful for them, but you know what? It is wonderful for us. It's wonderful for all of us who've ever struggled with death or the thought of death. Jesus said, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. I mean, do you get this? this? Nobody would have put these words in Jesus' mouth. For your sake, he says, for my sake, for your sake, for all, all people of all time, for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. I'm glad I was not there to heal Lazarus so that you may believe. But let us go to him. And then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. In other words, if he's going to walk into it, let's just go with him. I kind of wonder what his tone was. Meanwhile, back in Bethany, I'm sure that Mary and Martha and all the other people that gathered around to mourn the death of Lazarus were asking, where is Jesus? I mean, he missed it all. When Lazarus was still alive, he didn't show up. Lazarus died. He missed the funeral. He missed the viewing. Lazarus has already been buried and the tomb had been sealed. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. So many Jews from Jerusalem came and to, to comfort Mary and to comfort Martha on the death of their brother. Now, when Jesus shows up, Martha heard that he was coming. She went outside to meet Jesus, and I love her honesty. I love how just open she is with Jesus. She comes to Jesus and says, Lord, Martha said to him, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I wish I could have known the tone of her voice. 
I kind of think she was like pointing her finger at Jesus and almost laying the blame on him. Jesus, we called for you. Jesus, we asked you to come and help. You could have done it, Jesus, but you didn't. Jesus, if you would have been here, our brother would have lived. Now, my friends, I I love this because this is extremely comforting for us. When we feel like that at times, that that Jesus, you could have made a difference, but you didn't. We've all been there, haven't we? And I love how she clings to her faith. I mean, she's holding on tight. And she says to Jesus, but I know that even now, Jesus, even though that my brother is dead, even though he's been buried, I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will live again. Martha answered, I know he will live, he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And it's almost like Jesus is about ready to go into preaching mode. And and Martha, she doesn't want to hear it. Jesus, I don't need a sermon. Jesus, I don't need any platitudes. I I don't need any of these like pick-me-up one-liners. I don't need to hear theology, Jesus. My brother just passed away. And Jesus looked at her. And Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Martha, life and resurrection are standing before you. Martha, the one who believes in me, the one, whoever, in any time, the person who believes in me will live. See, Jesus is talking to Mary and Martha. Jesus is talking to us. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives and by, by believing in me will never die. <laughs> Do you believe this? Oh, my friends, there is no way that she could have taken all of that in. There is no way that she fully understood what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying to her, you will die, but you won't. I mean, Jesus is extremely clear here that death, death is simply a transition. Death, by faith, death is simply a doorway from this world to our heavenly home. She looks at Jesus and she says, yes, Lord, she replied, I believe. I believe that you are the the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Don't ask me to explain it. I don't understand everything. I don't fully grasp it all. But Jesus, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went out to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had come to to who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, here it is again, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And I love this. I mean, this is a tender moment. Divine empathy. I think it's moments like this, maybe even this moment, that Peter would later record, cast all of your anxiety, cast all of your cares on him because he cares for you. I I love this moment. See, what comes next is not trivial. What comes next is extremely important. Jesus asked, where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. And it's one verse. Two words which are extremely powerful. Divine empathy. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? There it is, when God could have, but he didn't. (laughs) But he didn't for our sake, for our sake. You see, in a single moment, Jesus condensed all of eternity into the span of a single afternoon. All of those questions that you and I have, all of the disappointment 
and the pain and the fear and the anger, all of the unanswered prayers, all condensed into a single afternoon with a resolution. So that we, so that you and I could have a living hope. The scripture goes on to say, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. Hum, but Lord, but oh, wait, wait a minute here, Jesus. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there for four days. It's like, whoa, Jesus. I love the King James Version. But Lord, he stinketh. Anyway, Jesus, you're too late. He, I mean, he, it's been over four days. The, the soul has left the body is what they believed. He's been in the tomb in that kind of heat. Jesus, decay has already begun. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. You will see the glory of God. My friends, I believe this is for each and every one of us. Then Jesus looked up and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. See, there it is. Our questions are being answered. The question of first importance. It's not a question of good and evil. The question is, who is Jesus? And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. I'm sure the people backed up. Whoa, whoa, they couldn't believe what they saw. They must have stood there with their mouths open in, in utter shock. Nobody was moving. Jesus said, take off the grave clothes and let them go. And then what he says next is like, well, duh. I mean, it's, it, he goes on as John writes, Therefore, many, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did and believed in him. Many. And all of a sudden, there began this explosion of activity around Jerusalem and its region. Many people saw and they believed and they trusted. They saw Jesus perform these signs. They believed him, they trusting in him. They were spreading word and more and more people were beginning to trust, come to faith in Jesus. And then Jesus entered Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry where people were, were, were waving their palm branches, the Jewish flag of victory. They were waving palm branches, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They thought Jesus was going to be an earthly king that would deliver them, not from evil, but would deliver them, or not from their sins, but from the evil of the Roman Empire. And the Jewish religious leadership, the Sanhedrin, the high priest, along with the, the 72 Sanhedrin, went on to say, if we let him go on like this, I mean, look at the audacity, look at the arrogance of these guys. If, if we let him go on like this, then everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. If we let him go on. Yeah, as if they have any choice. It was in John chapter 10 that Jesus said, I have the power, I have the authority to lay down my life and to take it up again. It's the light of the world. The light of the world came into the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved you. For God so loved the world. For God so loved me. For God so loved us. Even though we are evil. Even though we are bad, God loved us and gave his life for us to pay the ransom, to pay the debt that we could not pay so that we could have everlasting life. For God loved us even though we were bad, even though we were evil. In John, he, he concludes in John chapter 20. Now Jesus did many other signs 
He did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in these book, in this book. But these signs, these are written so that you, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And here's the purpose, and that by believing, you may have life, eternal life in his name. Hey, thank you for joining me. Have a great day. God bless and live love.